morning and I just have to say how wonderful it is to see all these early risers. <laughs> well we are here today to celebrate and to remember the life of Dr. Thomas Sikama, who typically preferred to be called just Tom. I for one was amazed to learn so much more about him when I read the tribute to Tom that was written by Dr. Stephen Hamburg, who was the chief scientist of the Environmental Defense Fund and chair of the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation. For more than 40 years, Tom was a teacher and mentor at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. But it is essential for all of us to hear now from a person who knew him as a teacher and a colleague. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce to you one of Tom's former students and then co-worker for almost 20 years, Ellen Denny. Thank you, Ray. Tom was a dear friend of mine, and as to many others, a beloved mentor. If you got to know him well, you realized he was a kind-hearted man. Can you hear me? No. Okay. You, uh, there we go. Okay. Um, I'll just start. <laughs> Tom was a dear friend of mine, and as to many others, a beloved mentor. If you got to know him well, you realized he was a kind-hearted man. But as a professor, he maintained a persona as a quirky yet lovable curmudgeon who was a little bit intimidating. He was direct, did not suffer fools, and called it how he saw it. He was known to say to advisees, I don't care what the hell you do, or why the hell would you want to do that? <laughs> But for those who paid attention, he had many important lessons to teach about trees and soil and critters, about reading the history in the landscape, about how to live life fully, and about leaving a legacy for the future. I first met Tom 20 years ago as a master's student in forest ecology and took an instant liking to his honesty and irreverence. After graduation, I went on to become the field lab and data manager for his research at Hubbard Brook, New Hampshire. We sat next to each other at our computers day after day for six years. I think we got along so well because A, I love cats just as much as he did, <laughs> and B, because I understood his filing system. <laughs> Tom's files consisted of piles and piles of folders spread out across every horizontal surface in his expansive lab. It made no sense to anyone else, but Tom knew exactly where everything was. My grandfather had the same system, and I learned as a toddler not to touch or move any of the clutter in his house or there would be hell to pay. 
<laughs> so I made it easy on Tom because I already possessed the skills necessary to navigate peacefully within his world and knew to put everything back exactly where I found it. He did not need to train me. Eventually I moved to Maine, but I continued to work on the Hubbard Book Project and look after, much, look after much of Tom's data from afar. He cared deeply that his efforts to collect and archive long-term ecological data would be carried forward by the next generation of researchers. After all those years of managing his data, he trusted me to be his memory because he was afraid it would eventually fail him. As it turns out, it never did. Upon his retirement a few years ago, I made a promise to him to ensure the continuity of his research legacy. And most of his projects have now been adopted by other colleagues, a few of them are, who are here today. So Tom's legacy lives on. When we learned that Tom was in hospice care, we let everyone know and gave them an opportunity to say goodbye. In the 50 days Tom was in hospice, Judy received over 150 letters that she read to Tom from formal stu former students and colleagues. They're here in a binder. That is right here. <laughs> that we'll put over on that table. And uh, I encourage you to peruse them if you're interested. Dearest Tom, we will miss your quirky personality as well as the quiet grace and humility that lay beneath. You taught us not only how to read the landscape and think on long time scales, but so much more. To never fear ignoring ridiculous rules, questioning dogma, or sounding stupid. To always let common sense prevail, to trust our intuitions, and to pursue what we love and believe in, even if it does not bring conventional success. Long live your spirit in us and in those who we in turn touch. Thank you. And now I want to introduce Tom's wife, Judy Sikama, who is in turn going to introduce the family. of us as um, we proceed. And Chris is in a shirt that he ordered special for today. He wants to show you. <laughs> if you recognize the, <laughs> recognize the card. <laughs> Carly is almost 10, and she's been a, such a big help. I couldn't have done it without her. <laughs> My brother is only three years younger than I am. And he has surpassed all tests. George is um, George Pillsbury, has a name tag on, and he can raise his hand so that everybody can say, hey boy, there's grandpa. <laughs> Charlie knows who you are. <laughs> and his beautiful wife, Celine, is beside him, and Charlie's getting all excited. <laughs> and then we have my sister, who has been my right hand man for the last two or three weeks, <laughs> and she's also my right hand man. And she's nine years younger than I am. Think about it. Wow. <laughs> Sharon, she's been she's been very very helpful. Who got? Glenn had coffee before we got here, so she was okay. Glenn is her husband, grow up. <laughs> and behind Sharon is George, his son, George's son, Mark. 
You can raise your hand. No, you don't just stand. <laughs> and Mark is the father of that little baby, Charlie. And I heard a, I heard Charlie being mentioned all the way around as he came in. And he he's grown at least two months since I last saw him. And Joanne is sitting beside her mom. And they were married three years ago, correct? Two, only two years ago, I'm sorry. <laughs> coming up, coming up. This was a third. <laughs> two and a half, two and a half. And Joanne, Joanne's mom, Julie, is beside her on the left. Did I forget anybody? Oh, yes, I did. In front of me is a beautiful, beautiful person by the name of Keith. And Keith Pillsbury is my um, father's youngest brother's <laughs> we just had a 90th family reunion about um, this summer, this summer, just before the summer was over in Valence Bay, and we were all there. 90th family reunion in um, Valence Bay. Reach Holly. It wasn't Pillsbury, but Reach Holly. And um, Penny is to his right, and they love England. <laughs> And that's where his Keith's mother came from. And that's where Ralph met her. Anyways, <laughs> thank you so much for the introduction. Did I forget anybody? I don't think so. OK. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> Marilyn is Chris's mom. And I haven't seen her since probably, what, 10, 8 years maybe, 6, 8 years. And she changed her hair color. <laughs> she, became, she became like us. <laughs> and her husband is beside my daughter. Fred. Fred. Thank you so much. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> Where are we here? Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Now, there may well be other members of the family who would like to share some thoughts, some reflections, and uh, we invite you just to raise your hand and someone will bring a microphone to you if there's something that you especially would like to share. Um, I'm Steve Hamburg. Uh, so I was one of the mice the There's one over there. All right. Yeah. No, I, I've used this a few times in my life. Um, uh, so, Steve Hamburg, I've worked with Tom, like with Ellen, only twice as long for 40 years. And um, I don't know, for many of you, not having spent the same kind of time that we did with Tom, just a couple of the things that that really made him special. And as I came here, I couldn't help think, because there's a red light, for those of you who know what I'm about to say, there's a red light up there. I turned red on, uh, right on red. And um, I used to do a lot of uh, trips with Tom. We'd go up to research meetings together. And um, I don't know, it was probably close to 40 years that Tom kept track of every uh, stoplight that he approached, because he was determined to, to figure out how much of his life was wasted at red lights. So he literally, uh, he's the only person I know who kept that, and if you were in the shotgun seat, your job was to always record whether you, it was green, it was red, did you make a red light, uh, did you turn right on a red? And, um, and that was Tom. Uh, and, the, and to the T. But, but it's, what I really want to stress is that wasn't, as Ellen said, I can't stress enough, that was the outward Tom. And the inner Tom, I'll just say, one of the very first things I did as a graduate student, I was working on, for those who are here, scientists on allometric equations, and I couldn't make the equations which were published work. And Tom told me how to do it, I did it, I came back to him, a, few hours later and I said I tried it this way and that way they don't work and he told me in very flowery language that all of those who know what it might have been uh, that, that I probably wasn't up to the task <laughs> but he did come an hour later to me and again in flowery language say you're right <laughs> and we spent the following probably six years 
sorting out the problem. Tom never gave up. He was incredibly open-minded. He would always look for the alternative explanation, and it really characterized who Tom was. And um, I know there are others here in the front row who spent a lot of time working with Tom, and it was always the pleasure of, of being with Tom. And, and again, I had a lot of time to talk because we drove for many years. I live in Providence and have for a long time, and I would stop by New Haven and pick Tom up, and we'd go up to the Cary Arboretum, the Cary Institute. So we had these drives together, the two of us, for, for a decade or more, multiple times a year. And Tom was incredibly open, thoughtful, irreverent, and um, it was just a tremendous pleasure to spend those 40 years with Tom. In, first as a student, totally intimidated, as Ellen said, I thought I didn't count, and uh, to being somebody who, who really could call him a colleague and a friend. If you'd like to speak, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Anyone else from the family, friends? I didn't know Tom well. He wasn't here enough long, long enough. For me to know him well, but I just love that hat. <laughs> Anybody who would come into a new community with a hat saying, older than dirt, <laughs> was going to be a friend of mine. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to know him better. Well, we didn't know Tom all that well either, but we do have a support group for people with Parkinson's, and he was part of that group, he and Judy both. And we had very a lot of quality time together during our meetings. And I have to say that Tom certainly picked the perfect wife because <laughs> <laughs> Judy leaves no stone unturned. She, I'm sure this is true with everything that she does, but um, she researched this and researched that and brought us a lot of information that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And uh, it's always so true that you find out about people after they're gone, which is, is a pity, but it's also a joy. And I just wanted to give a tribute to Judy for all that she did for Tom. I'm a resident at Wake Robin and did not know Tom very well. But two people I know did know him very well. Um, and at Judy's request and with the permission of these two people, I want to share with you what they wrote to me after they learned of Tom's death. They sent it by email. Um, the first is from Nan Jenks J, who's Dean of Environmental Affairs at Middlebury College. Um, and she wrote, I was saddened to learn recently of Tom Sycamus passing. He was greatly admired and valued by generations of Yale FES graduate students. When I entered the FES program, all incoming students participated in a summer program with Tom, all um, before the academic year began. The experience both bonded the classmates and gave the wildly diverse students a keen lens on ecology, and an exceptional field experience. Many were fortunate to have spent time in the field with Tom and experienced his discerning eye and joyful view of life. His research was also so relevant at Hubbard Brook. He was one in a million. I hadn't known that Tom and his wife were living at Wake Robin in Shelburne, but it pleased me when I learned of it. The other email was from our son Brad, who is Associate Dean for Professional Practice at the school. Homecoming occurred shortly after Tom died, and word of his passing spread among his former students as they returned to the campus. 
Brad wanted to capture the tone of their reactions when he wrote, Conversations with returning alums underscored for me what an incredibly important and inspirational part Tom was of so many students' time at FES. The lessons he taught them in the field resonated with the reasons they chose to come to FES for graduate training in the first place. And those same lessons have supported their careers in countless ways since then. Judy and I went to a garden show in Williston this spring, and as we were leaving, there was a volunteer standing at the end of the driveway, and Judy had on her white robin name tag, and this man looked at her and he said, do you know Tom Sycamore? And she said, yes, he's my husband. And